very elegant segue. Um, <laughs> okay, good afternoon, everybody. Um, indeed, that's exactly um, where I'm picking up um, on this question of evidence. And I must admit, when I um, put something onto Twitter this morning about what I was doing, I was teaching about impacting, uh, ev evidencing impact, I thought, God, that sounds so boring. Um, I couldn't think how to make it sound entertaining at all. But I think in an audience here, hopefully, actually, um, I am certainly preaching to the converted um, in terms of the value of archaeology and education. So um, what I'm going to talk about is a program called the Higher Education Field Academy, um, which we refer to as HEFA, as an acronym. Had I known when I set this up in 2005 that it was going to run for, well, it's been running for 11 years now and is still running, had I known it was going to have legs of that length, I'd have called it something slightly snappier in the first place. Um, and we did, for a while, at the very beginning, when the project was just starting, struggle for internet visibility with the Heart of England Ferret Association. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I now feel rather guilty about the poor old ferret people because we've sort of um, uh, rather blown them out of the uh, water as far as visibility is concerned. I don't even know if they're still going. One of these days, I'm just going to check. Um, anyway, um, I set up Access Cambridge Archaeology in Cambridge, as many of you will know, and ran that until last year. Um, and one of the first things I did with that was the Higher Education Field Academy. And as you can see, and as it says on the screen, um, the aim of it was to raise educational aspirations, um, particularly regarding going to university um, amongst disadvantaged state educated teenagers. So we were working very much with the secondary school cohort, um, mainly students in year nine and 10. So that's the sort of 13, 14, 15 year olds. Um, and the idea was to do this by involving them in new archaeological excavations um, with the aim of, as you can see, developing attitudes, skills and knowledge that would help them in due course make competitive, confident applications to university. Um, so it was part of the widening participation agenda, as it is um, sort of tends to be termed. Um, UK governments have a long time aspired to widen participation in higher education. Um, and progress has been made. The um, uh, Labour government, uh, previous Labour government, were very, very committed to this. Um, and because of changes made while they were in power, the general principles of support for widening participation in education participation in education have continued on, uh, perhaps not quite, well actually no, I won't comment on that. Um, <laughs> um, anyway, uh, notwithstanding a huge amount of progress that has been made, um, particularly in uh, places such as London, um, the rates at which young people progress to university vary hugely across the country and I'm just putting that map up there where uh, as you can see it's different colours in different areas. Um, a dark blue is the top quintile, the largest proportion of children going to university. Um, red is the lowest quintile and yellow is in the middle. And as you can see there are clearly a lot of areas where there are issues, um, many of them rural. Um, when we, when I set up the Higher Education Field Academy, the main aim was social, not archaeological. It's not about recruiting young people to study archaeology at university. It is unashamedly instrumentalising archaeology for what it can do for wider communities. Um, and in this, there's, uh, I, I would never make any apology for that. I think archaeology justifies its place by what it can do for the wider community. Um, but if it can do that, it can then justify the investment in preserving it and ensuring that we hand on that heritage to future generations. We're only temporary guardians of it. Um, but in the meantime, people are important, and Heffer was about people. Um, it was set up in the halcyon days of the early um, 2000s when AIM Higher was in existence um, with a reasonable budget nationwide to carry out widening participation programs. And HEFA was started as a program that was part of their summer school um, scheme where um, they had to run over two days at least. And the aim was to give young people an experience of higher education. Um, on the principle that most children, it was targeting children for whom nobody in their family had previously been to university, so it simply wasn't a familiar concept to them. 
Um, the Higher Education Field Academy Heifer aimed to exceed those aims of simply familiarising students with university and of the processes involved in getting there. Certainly, it wanted to raise those academic aspirations. It also wanted to boost knowledge and confidence and also to enhance knowledge and skills. I was very committed right from the start that we shouldn't be aiming just to leave children inspired and excited about the idea of going to university, but should leave them better able to make that aspiration come true. I didn't want to leave them high and dry with a, yeah, I'd love to go to university, but actually I wanted to help them be able to achieve the grades, uh, the work habits and all those sorts of things that would enable them to get to university. Um, as I said, we were targeting students in school years 9 and 10 with some students in year 12, 6 formers who'd come along supervising. Um, it now, um, since changes, since the um, uh, coalition government came in uh, with the changes of the tuition fees regime and the abolition of AIM Higher, it targets students who are capable of getting eight or more GCSEs A star to B. In the AIM Higher years, it was targeting students capable of getting five GCSEs at A to C. So very much in the AIM Higher years, we were particularly targeting students who are on the CD borderline for GCSE. Um, and we were targeting students who were disadvantaged in various sorts of ways. We never made a big play of you're all disadvantaged, that's why you're here. But the schools that were targeted, particularly in the M higher years, were schools which, uh, to which relatively low numbers of students went to university, were in postcodes with areas of low rates of progression. And within those, the students who would be prioritised to attend would be those uh, where no previous family member had been to university, or whether teachers felt they were struggling, or whether um, their pastoral care team felt they needed some sort of level of support. So the objectives fell into three categories, and these are still exactly the same objectives. The objectives for Heifer have, have been consistent all the way through. To find out about university by working for two days with us on a university-led excavation, um, during which time they will meet university staff and students. They'll spend a day in university and find out about the technicalities of applying to university, which um, I would imagine most of us in this room perhaps have been to university. If you come from a family where you've done that, it, it's, it's, an obvious, it's an easy next step to envisage but not so much if nobody's ever done that before. Second set of objectives was about developing skills and this is what I'm really mainly going to focus on in terms of this um, evidence. Um, we identified very explicitly what those skills were. So it's very easy to make that claim of, oh, well, they developed lots of skills. We worked very hard, and from 2009, we worked with Cambridge Assessment to identify those skills, work out exactly how those would be demonstrated, and I'll come back to that in a minute. But you can see those skills listed, and we'd all recognise those, as, as I think, as skills you can gain during archaeological excavation, but I don't think we all, all, all necessarily always actually have those listed out and discriminated out. And obviously, within all of those skill sets, there are subsets. Um, third set of objectives was the basic archaeological goals we set them. So we needed an activity that was replicatable and scalable so that all students participating in the Field Academy would have broadly the same opportunity because they were carrying out broadly the same activity. Now it's in the nature of archaeological excavation that you never you know, you never do the same dig twice. Um, so any dig you do will always turn up different stuff and it always throw up different challenges. But we made a virtue of that through some of the um, sort of uh, assessment aims. But essentially they were doing one metre square test pits um, within cores, currently occupied rural settlements. And in that it fitted into research that I was interested in, in the development of historic settlements. And it was very important, I felt it was fundamentally important that the students would know that the work they were doing was of inherent value in itself. They're not doing a sort of uh, processed activity that's just for them. They are contributing to research. They are creating new knowledge. Their input is being valuable because that helps bolster self-confidence if they know they're doing something valuable. Um, and while sort of, um, uh, you know, mocked up excavations have a very valuable role, I wanted to take them beyond that and, and get them involved in something where they were actually contributing. Um, the one metre square test pit excavations are great within currently occupied rural settlements because they're pretty much the only technique you can use for excavating in places where you've got people's homes and gardens on top of the archaeology. And by aggregating 
creating them together, um, you can create a bigger picture. So if you've got 20 or 30 test pits in one village, you can see how the settlement developed. And then you can combine different villages together. So from that point of view, it's a very good model for academic research. The way you set yourself out a question, you develop a methodology, you collect data, and then you evaluate that data and combine it with other data to look at a bigger picture. So we were also introducing students to that learning by discovery model of higher learning, which would prepare them for university. So just that I'm not going to um, linger on this really at all, but the basic principle here is a village. This is Purton in Hertfordshire. Um, those are the sites of all of the test pits we've dug, not shown to scale, I would point out. Um, <laughs> and what we do is then date the pottery that comes from the different test pits. It's a very straightforward method, really. So this is where the Roman pottery, all the uh, grey or black circles are where pottery of uh, given date has come from. And as you can see, the Roman pottery is up in the uh, top left-hand corner and the bottom right. Uh, into the Anglo-Saxon period, you can see the Roman settlement disappears. In the late Anglo-Saxon period, you can see the village on its current footprint is founded, and there's clearly something fairly major going on along the bottom. High medieval, you can see how it grows. You can see the impact of the Black Death and picking up afterwards. So you can see how this data, which is collected by students on the field academy, and I have to say the local community got involved in Perton as well, which is how we got to 115 test pits. But you can see how it builds up into that picture. And it's also a relatively straightforward research model to be able to explain to young people who haven't got a great deal of time to sit and have this explained to them because they want to get out digging. Um, and by aggregating the information from these individual sites, we can look at bigger pictures. So this is uh, sort of Rome going from the top right along the top, Roman, Ang early Anglo-Saxon, late Anglo-Saxon, high medieval, post black death, late medieval. So you can see how the sort of population, settlement change and so on is changing over time. And we can map this across the whole area. We were working across the six counties of East Anglia on these sites. Perton's shown in red there, the one I showed you in detail down on the um, southwest. Um, and this is uh, the volume of pottery from these settlements before the Black Death. And this is afterwards. So you can start to look at all sorts of interesting questions from this. Um, but digging the test pits as part of that is it's scalable, it's broad ranging and it's a life and learning program. They carry out the whole process of the excavation from being briefed at the very beginning about how to do the digging. They lay out their test pit, make sure it's a metre square. We explain why they have to be the same shape and size so we can compare the data from different pits. They follow strict procedures to take the turf off in square so it'll go back neatly afterwards. They go down 10 centimetres at a time. They record each surface before they dig it down in a handbook. Uh, they sieve all the soil through a standard 10, 10 millimetre mesh sieve. Um, they retain everything they think might possibly be of any interest. Um, we have archaeologists on site going around visiting um, the test pits all the time, but they're set to be running their own dig while they're, while they're on site. And then at the end, it's filled back in and left looking pristine and immaculate, we hope, most of the time. Uh, we are working in the gardens of members of the public. They do that over two days, come into the university for the third day, then they write a report on their excavation. So they're basically mimicking the whole of the archaeological excavation process, except they get the reports done rather more promptly, possibly, than some of us might have done at some points in time. Um, the... Um, the response to this is brilliant. The kids have, um, really do respond to whatever gets thrown at them. This is a big challenge. They've never done anything like this before. The weather is unpredictable, um, uh, as are the fines. Um, and um, uh, it um, has a fantastic impact. Now, it's very easy to say that by showing a few photos of smiling kids. And I have a lot of photos of smiling kids. Um, and indeed, are some of the artefacts, if they don't um, make finds by digging them out of the ground, they can make finds by sculpting them. And I sometimes think we should run this as an art project. Um, but when we're talking about impact, we need something more robust than that. And the reason we need something more robust in the way of impact is partly so that we can prove it works and justify people continuing to fund it. And partly, and even more importantly, is so that the people who are taking part, the young people themselves, know what it is that they've achieved and gained from it. So we ask them the fairly basic, obvious before and after questions. So they will fill in things about, I appreciate you can't read these, um, but uh, uh, do they feel confident about trying something new on a scale of one to five? Do they feel positive about staying in school after year 11? Do they feel positive about going to university? Do they feel they know about life at university? We ask them to record those on a scale of one to five before the course starts, as you can see from the title of that questionnaire. 
and at the course end. So we can then monitor that impact when we've got, again, these same questions, which is on that page here. So again, you've got that, at the top there, you've got those same questions, those same five-point scale. Um, and we also get qualitative feedback. So we get them to fill in comments. And we can also, of course, read their reports um, for comments. Um, so we get uh, fantastic feedback, as I suspect most of us do, um, if we're running good outreach activities. Um, and I love the one about Alton Towers. Um, uh, this was genuinely from the very first heifer we ever read, the, uh, where we ever ran the alternative to the field academy was going to Alton Towers. And two of the kids were overheard walking back from site saying, this is cooler than a trip to Alton Towers. <laughs> but we have always wanted to get more than that because it's relatively, again, straightforward to get these. So how much did you um, enjoy, even when you got that before and after? Um, in 2008, we started working with Cambridge Assessment, who run the OCR exam board. And from that, we have developed a framework for assessing skills, which is very, very detailed, very robust, and has enabled HEFA, the Field Academy Programme, to be validated by OCR as a learning programme of, of value. Um, we have drilled down into exactly what these skills are, working with people at Cambridge Assessment, where assessment is what they do. For most of us in this room, I suspect, and I stand to be corrected, assessment is sort of something you do as an adjunct to what you're mainly doing. For people who work at Cambridge Assessment, assessment is what they do, and it doesn't matter to them whether they're assessing an archaeological project or an exercise in weights and measures. It's assessment. The science of assessment is a world that I was astonished when I discovered quite how massive it was. Maybe I was naive beforehand. But we worked with people who work in assessment because we wanted a valid model for this. So again, I appreciate you can't read all of this. Um, but the framework we use for assessing these skills, what the students gain on the Field Academy, is broken down into these sections. So this is from the written report where it's very explicit about what is, what is required in the uh, left-hand column here. And then the performance level, and we're doing this so that the assessments are objective, whoever is doing the assessment. So we need to make sure that whenever you go on a field academy, whoever is assessing your work, the same sort of performance and same sort of behaviour is going to result in the same uh, level of assessment. So we have a series of range descriptors for each area of activity, um, uh, for each skill. We have identified the behaviours that will evidence that skill. And then we have these range descriptors that shows the level at which it's been achieved. And there is a low level descriptor, a medium level, level descriptor, and a high level one. Um, if you were able to read those through in detail, you were, they're actually quite entertaining to read in a slightly um, uh, tongue in cheek sort of way. But they do mean that you can read these through and match the behaviour of the student you're assessing quite easily to this. So within each of these three, low, middle, and high, um, each student is assessed within that as low, middle and high. So effectively, the overall assessment is on a nine point scale, but it's very explicit exactly where on that scale they sit. This is for just the written assessment. And that's all of it there. So it covers everything from the uh, structuring the port, from the writing skills, the research skills, the IT skills. Um, so that we can produce a report back to the students explaining exactly what they did well, where their strengths were, um, and um, what their overall attainment was. Now, doing that for a written report is not unfamiliar territory for an organisation like Cambridge Assessment, which runs the OCR exam board um, and is very used to doing these sorts of assessments. And I don't think they're anything to do with the slight problem that's been this morning, if anyone's heard the news about the test papers for the year level SATs having been published on the website. Um, it's nothing to do with them. Um, and it does make the point about assessment in some respects. Um, what is less familiar for organisations like Cambridge Assessment and what is difficult for all organisations trying to assess skills is the soft skills, the personal skills. And these are the skills that actually make a huge amount of difference when young people are applying to university or indeed applying for jobs. It's that cultural capital that people who come from uh, better off backgrounds, um, higher up the sort of socioeconomic scale, have much more in the way of cultural capital, they know how to talk to people, they know how to um, engage with people, um, 
all of those soft skills, and they're much more difficult to assess. There is no framework for assessing these soft skills. They used to be known as personal learning and thinking skills, the PLUTS skills. So what we, in working with Cambridge Assessment, we spent a lot of time thinking about what are these soft skills that the students develop, and develop on the Field Academy, and again, how can we assess them? Um, and this is the framework that we've come out with. Now, this is slightly a larger print here, so some of you might be able to read some of this, but um, I haven't put it up to uh, enable you to read it in detail so much as to make a general point that these are the sort of skills that are being assessed. So verbal communication, for example, We've thought about well, what are they actually, what is verbal, what are they doing, what are they really getting, what can we tell them that they've got in the way of skills if we say you've got verbal communication skills and more to the point if they are going for an interview and want to be able to say oh I've got verbal communication skills. So we broke them down into two categories. So it's communicating explanations, being able to talk about what you've got and pitch your explanation appropriately and clearly to different audiences. And then there's a completely different sort of verbal communication skill, which is engaging in a discussion to make a decision, deciding what you're going to do next. And that's a very difficult, different verbal communication skill. You've got to be able to talk to someone, resolve any disagreements, and come up with a good way of talking through that that doesn't antagonise the situation. So we've got two different forms of verbal communication. Again, the range descriptors, low, medium, and high for each of those. And just to give you some detail on one of them, structured working. So this is, um, again, a good thing to be able to do, show you can work in an organised manner. Plan and carry out, so this is a summary of what this skill is. Plan and carry out, scheme of work in a structured manner and within required time. And you can see how that would feel with, fit within a test bit excavation that needs to be completed in two days. And you can see, again, this is the low, middle and high level range descriptors. Um, and uh, yeah, again, you can see the interval has shown minimal interest in planning or carrying out the required tasks in the correct order or within a reasonable time frame, taking either far too much or far too little time on the tasks. And you can see it's relatively easy to match that to a behaviour. On the other hand, the individual uses a handbook without prompting to proactively plan to help drive through an effective programme of work. He she has identified objectives and defined tasks clearly, been proactive in monitoring progress, ensuring tasks are comp completed on time. That's the sort of information. We've got explicit, clear information about what it is that somebody has done, how they have behaved, and how that relates to a skill of structured working. These are assessed. Um, we get the students to assess their performance themselves. We're not trying to conceal from them that they're being assessed. We encourage them, if they want to, to read the range descriptors, read all of the information, and think for themselves about how they're performing. This is partly to give them the opportunity to perform to the best of their ability. They can't say, oh, I didn't know you were looking at that, miss. I'd have tried harder if I'd known. They've got that opportunity to think, oh, actually, maybe I am a being a bit sort of not bothering with that. I'll, I'll just pick that up a little bit. But also, as importantly, by self-assessing, it helps make them more aware of the skills they're gaining. It's very easy for them to come off the two days of the digging and think, oh, you had a great time, it's fantastic, I met some new people, that's wonderful. But actually, if they've sat and worked through the assessment thing, they know the sort of skills they're picking up, and that means they come out of the field academy with greater confidence in themselves as people with skills and ability and experience and a track record in those skills. So these are all broken down. So here you can see these again. Here's the verbal communication skills, for example, the structured working ones are up the top there. Um, and again, uh, these are the marking sheets, low, middle, high, and broken down into three within them. So this is the student's assessment sheet that they assess themselves on, student evaluation form, the skill evaluation form for students. And then the test fit supervisors will also assess them as well. So we get the two separate assessments. And the supervisors will go through the assessment, the mark they're giving the students with them. We encourage them to do a preliminary assessment at the end of the first day and then firm it up at the end of the second day. So that if there's a student who's looking a bit low in one or two things, the supervisor can say, well, this is where I'm marking you at the moment, and it gives them a chance to pick up their, their um, standard. And we then feed that back to the participants at the end of the field academy after they've submitted their written report and we've marked it using the framework. Um, they get a letter back of which there's a standard front page saying, um, you know, well, please, we've done a good job, um, you know, good luck for the future and all that. And then they will get this sheet on the assessment of these skills. And this sheet actually provides the information that they need to be able to use that. So 
For each of these skills, it talks about what this skill is. So just to talk about the one that I can reach, um, measuring and recording. And you can say, obviously, that's something they do on the archaeological dig, on the test bit excavation, a very basic part of it, um, required within the um, framework they're following, the, street, uh, the method they're using. So this section here talks about that skill and why it's important. Any data collection process requires procedures and observations to be documented, monitored and recorded to ensure the required information is retained. Measuring and recording skills are demonstrated on HEFA by completing context record um, sheets, drawings and location maps. So it's talking about what the skill is, why it's important and how you have deployed it on the field academy. And then it has the section from the range of script or an adapted version of it um, uh, explaining what the individual performance was like on the field academy and these will vary depending on the mark so each of those one to nine scale marks will get a slightly di well, differently worded comment there um, so that's the technical skills so in the soft skills here uh, the verbal communication for example up there um, again it talks effective verbal communication is a vital skill whether to convey information or engage in discussion and debate so again it explains what the skill is talks about how you use it on heifer on HEP, you can demonstrate your verbal skills by explaining um, your work situations, or, I'm sorry, explaining what you're doing and what you found to those who ask, and by taking part in verbal discussion involving decision making. So it's all very explicit, but it's also a hugely useful thing for each of the students to have this letter that they can then keep when they start to make applications for, for part time jobs, for sixth form college, or for university. They've got that to refer back to. They're actually thinking, what am I going to put in my personal statement? They've got that to refer back to. So as a result of that, when we start to talk about impact, we have very, very robust data for this. We uh, collect the basic information on the enjoyment, which is all very good. Um, this is just from 2014, the data. It's having the most model graph I happen to have on the slide here. It's very consistent over the years. Um, this, again, is they feel more positive about going to college university. You can see the numbers that come up as agreeing. Vast percentage agree, uh, strongly agree that is the case. Um, we ask whether they, before and after, um, are they considering applying to Russell Group universities, to Cambridge universities, to see how that sort of higher level um, academic aspiration is being impacted by the Field Academy. Um, we asked the school staff for how they would rate um, HEFA. As you can see, it's rated even higher by the staff. We asked them whether they think their students learn, um, how do their students feel. We look at this before and after. We ran one, I've just recently moved to University of Lincoln, so we ran one in Lincolnshire last autumn. Um, before the Field Academy, 60% were thinking of applying to university, which is unusually high for Lincolnshire. But by the end of it, it's 95%, so you can see that impact. But we've also, what we've also got is the data on these skills. And these are the students' assessments of the ways, the extent to which um, taking part in HEFA has helped them with those skills. So in these graphs, and these, all the, these six um, personal learning and thinking, these soft skills, um, these six different um, types. And you can see how uh, the blue one is, the blue part of the pie chart is the, the percentage who've been helped or feel that being on the Field Academy has helped them. So what we've got is this hugely robust data because it's firmly evidenced, it's very explicit, and it's been validated by being generated through working with people who are professionals in the field of assessment. We also track the longer term impact two years down the line at the end of year 11. We track whether they're still intending on going to university and ask them what subject they're intending studying. Um, mainly because we are not funded to encourage them to do archaeology. Therefore, I like to be able to demonstrate they're not all wanting to do archaeology. It would be at one level nice, but another level very problematic if it turned out they all were. In fact, more recently, the top subject has been medicine, I think, followed by natural sciences, followed, I think, by history at fourth, which I think is probably reflecting a little bit of a... But anyways, you see, it goes from A to Z. I'm always very grateful for zoology for providing a Z um, in this sort of thing. Um, so in summary, the, there are a lot of highlights of HEFA, which, relate, which will be reflected in many, um, many schools' archaeology projects. Um, one of the less common things is it is about explicitly raising educational aspirations beyond archaeology. It's not about drawing people into archaeology. It's about using archaeology to um, uh, achieve wider goals. Um, and at the bottom of that list, as you can see, it is high impact. It's been running for 11 years. We've done more than 100 heifers. We've had more than 5,000 students through it. 
91% um, have rated it excellent or good, 84% feel more positive about going to university, and more than 80% feel it helped develop specified skills. And I could break that down to within each of those skill sets and indeed to within the individual subsets within those skill sets. Um, so the key, I think, to this question of impact, and this is um, it's a big issue within universities, just out of interest, could you put your hand up if you're actually employed by a university? Okay, yeah, so, so those of the, all of those you've just put your hands up will be very familiar with the impact agenda in universities. So if you're going to put in an impact case study based on an activity you've run, you need to be able to show that you've made a difference. And the last time round when impact was assessed by the government, a lot of um, organisations didn't have the data to show this, and we, we did. We had 11 years worth, well, nine years of it then, because it was a couple of years ago. Um, but in fact, that need to show the impact of what you're doing is always valuable because if you can show the impact of the archaeological outreach work you've been doing, you can justify something like Kent County Council, like Steve was talking about earlier, requiring an outreach or an educational element within development because you can show that this is something that achieves a real benefit and the key really to achieving that impact is being explicit about what it is you're trying to achieve. This is this slide I showed earlier. Explicitly clear on what we're trying to achieve. On being very clear about how you're going to achieve it. Uh, not just I'm going to run a dig, but how are you actually going to, through running that dig, achieve those aims of raising academic aspirations, of boosting knowledge and confidence and of enhancing knowledge and skills. How are you going to identify that achievement? How are you going to show, how are you going to measure it? What is it going to be? What's it going to look like? How are you going to assess it? So that you can demonstrate that impact. And, it, and one should approach this as rigorously as you would do if you were developing a new um, medical drug treatment. You have to have the evidence that's tested it to see if it works and then show how it works. So in conclusion, um, I'll just summar up, summarise, have it involves disadvantaged teenagers with archaeological excavation explicitly instrumentalised, but still producing valid research data. And I could talk about that at great length, but won't now because it's not uh, relevant right at the minute. But it's, it's aimed to inspire and upskill. We've had 5,000 young people through it. I hope to expand it. Now I'm at a different institution and, and can do that. Um, and it's that key to its success and it survived the end of AIM Higher. We, we had a, all our funding from AIM Higher for a long time, then AIM Higher was closed down, but because we had the data, just a little archaeology project really, um, you know, uh, because we had that evidence that it had a much wider impact, we were able to not just keep it going but actually expand the numbers that are reached from it. So that's that really. Um, yeah.